Uh, actually, I would like to know how many of you are experimentalists. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I was kind of scared, like in the first lecture. <laughs> I'm not sure I can't understand what's going on. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I was intrigued by this clock. Actually, I'm hoping that I can buy this clock somewhere and put it in my lab. Um, so, so here. If the clock, if the hand is, if it's going to indicate real time, right? So you will go from one, two, three, four. Then it has to be rotating counterclockwise. So it's the opposite fashion of how the normal clock will run. Or if the, the, the hand is going to move the uh, clockwise fashion, then we'll have things moving backward in time. Okay. Um, so, um, so this. Workshop title is uh, CP violation. So I will start with the CP violation, but from the experimental list, uh, understanding of CP violation. Um, so I was intrigued by um, uh, this illustration. Um, I actually follow this excellent example by um, a recent book um, written by my colleagues in uh, Indiana Uni University, Professor Steve Victor. He, he retired. Um, and he spent uh, his first few years of retirement writing this book, Signatures of the Artist. And I read the first two chapters, and then I, I can uh, already get material I can use for, for my talk. So here is um, a plan feeling motif uh, with reptiles uh, by M.C. Escher. Okay, so you have two uh, lizards there. Now, if you put a mirror and then do a uh, the reflection on the mirror, and this is what you will see inside the mirror. Okay, so this reverse from left to right. Now if you put another mirror here on the bottom, then you further reflect the mirror from up to down, and that's what you get, okay? Okay, now if you do an, another operation to reverse black to white and white to black, and that's what you'll get here in the end, okay? So. So those, mi those two sequences of mirror refraction is going to give you a parity uh, state. So this image is going to be a uh, parity transform state uh, of the initial. And then this is going to refer to CP, so it's a parity, where C, uh, just you interchange the identity of a particle, an antiparticle. Here, P and CP here. So now if I remove the additional operation here, just compare the original picture to the final picture here. So I have a challenge for you. Can you find the differences between the final and yeah. the original picture? The eyes. The eyes? And this <laughs> Have you read this book? <laughs> have you seen this book somewhere else? No, it's the first time, but okay. Oh, cool. <laughs> Indeed, yes, that's the answer, the eyes. Make sure those are the subtleties. The eyes look different from the original. And also the signature of the artist. Okay, now the signature is here in the black, but now the signature is in the white. Okay, so the CP is not <laughs> conserved <laughs> in this case. So the fact that uh, our CP is not conserved in the universe, perhaps just is a signature of the artist who actually made the universe. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the point of the, of the book. Okay, we have um, CP violation. Okay. Um, who we already know exists in the K-on system and in B meson decay system. Um, but the CP violation also tells to, uh, means that we have finite amount of the T violation through the CPT theory. Uh, because most of this, our theories uh, the, are formulated uh, by the, the gauge theory. Uh, so we require the local uh, Lorentz gauge to be res respected. Okay, so now with the EDM here, I have a particle, okay, kind of a large size, so it can contain both positive and negative charge. If the EDM exists, means that there will be a separation between the positive charge cloud and negative charge cloud here. And that's illustrated by this D vector, the red vector. And most of the fundamental particles, they also have spin. Okay, so in this case, uh, I um, say take neutron. Okay, that's what I will be focused mostly on. Neutron, we know, has spin half, so you can only have spin up or down. There's no additional quantum numbers required to describe the state of the neutron. So if you need to describe 
the EDM based on the existing degree of freedom of neutron, the EDM can only exist in the alone or anti alone the direction of the spin. Okay, because if there's any orthogonal component to the spin, <coughs> then as the particle spins, the orthogonal component is going to get averaged out. So in the end, the final amounts will be EDM will be parallel or anti parallel. We don't know which one yet to the spin. Okay, so assuming that this is the the state of the neutron with coexistence of the spin and the electric dipole moment. Now on the time reversal, the EDM remains the same direction because it's a real vector, polar vector, and then the spin reverse direction because it's an axial vector. So the same thing will also happen under the parity reversal. Okay. So because the time symmetry, before you require time symmetry, that means the relative direction, <coughs> this and this, then will have to be equally populated. Okay? If time reversal symmetry is good. That means for a given spin state here, you are you are add fifty percent to this, fifty percent to this, in the end there's be no EDM left. Okay. So that's a, that's why that uh, if the time reversal symmetry is respected, then no EDM is allowed. And uh, that was used for a long time to argue that EDM should be zero until Norman Ramsey actually um, question whether that's true. Or you can take it the other way. If we can find a non-zero EDM, then time reversal symmetry must be violated. And therefore, through CPT theorem, CP also has to be violated by the same amount. Okay. Um, okay, so EDM. Uh, if time reversal symmetry is respected, no EDM is allowed. Okay, we haven't found any time reversal uh, invariant to a large degree yet. And then how come that we can already have large EDM in just normal, say, molecules, <coughs> polar molecule? Uh, in this example, it would be ammonia. Okay, so you have uh, three hydrogens on the bottom there. That's where the negative charge will be. And then one neutron on top. So you have positive charge on top, negative charge on the bottom, so you have an EDM. Okay, no problem with that. We Chemists major, uh, major this EDM or polar molecule all the time, but they, we never heard them announce that, oh, they discovered time reversal symmetry breaking. Okay. It's because um, in this ammonium uh, molecule, there are two possible um, uh, ground states. And you can have this rotation here okay, align in the same direction as the EDM, or you can also have under the time reversal, now the molecule will rotate in the opposite direction, so you have angular momentum going downward, but EDM is in the opposite direction. But the fact that <coughs> the so chemists find both states are equally palpable, and then um, they are over the same energy, so, you, so both of them are valid ground state. So you have to consider them as uh, the ground state together. And in fact, um, you can find out that the EDM here in this case now will be proportional to the spin and with some dipole separation here. So this is measured in terms of the uh, electron charge multiplied by the separation centimeter. And in this case, again, the same separation here, but because the uh, momentum is reversed, so you have to add the extra minus sign there. Okay, so since those ground states are valid, so I can actually do some manipulation. I can symmetrize the ground state okay, by adding these two wave functions together and then normalize it. Okay. And the nice part is that under time reversal operation, okay, so this becomes this and this becomes this. <coughs> okay. And it's still the same wave function. Okay, so then you get an uh, eigenstate um, that has a T operation uh, eigenvalue equal to 1, so this is T even. Okay. Now, you can also anti-symmetrize the wave function. Okay. Now, under the time reversal symmetry, this becomes this, and this becomes this. You get the actual minus sign. Okay. Again, it's the, it maps to the wave function as the original, except now you acquire actual minus sign. Um, so it's T odd. So it means by doing this, uh, now I construct time reversal operator eigenstates here that have good eigenvalue. And then all those energies are the same value uh, as what I start with. 
So the time reversal symmetry operator seemed to do play very well with the total Hamiltonian. So uh, they commute with each other means the Hamiltonian actually likes time reversal symmetry. So it incorporates time reversal symmetry. So the fact that the ammonium molecule has EDM does not require the time reversal symmetry to be broken. Okay. However, for fundamental particle, the situation is not uh, the same. So the fundamental particle actually they they don't have degenerate ground state because if I, if I want to put the spin together with with EDM, okay, this is the this is the only option here. Okay, either this or entire line. Either one of this has to be the ground state. You cannot have both in the ground state. I will tell you why. Okay, if assume that this is the ground state. <coughs> now on, under time reversal. Okay. Now the um, EDM will point to the same direction. Okay, so no no. Okay. Because uh, all right. I think I have to back up a little a little bit. Because the EDM has to, to follow the spin. The EDM can only take the direction of the spin. So EDM there has to be take the angular momentum, the spin um, a vector j there with some extra uh, factoring from the size of EDM. So on the time reversal, not only the spin reverse direction, EDM also reverse direction here for fundamental particles. <coughs> okay. So, but then the electric and magnetic field also reverse sign on the time reversal. So magnetic field reverse sign because the charge will be rotating in the opposite direction. But the EDM, there's no motion component, motional component to that, so electric field remains in the same direction. Now I can calculate the total energy. So the initial, my presumed ground state has energy of D coupled to the electric field and magnetic <coughs> moment coupled to the magnetic field here. And now my time reversal state will have now the EDM D now is opposite to the E field, so you have a minus sign. Now both the spin and magnetic field reverse, so minus minus, then you get an even. So the magnetic component doesn't change sign, but the electric field component change sign. So under time reversal, then you get a different energy compared with where you start. So you cannot treat those two as degenerate and add them up together the same way that we did for the ammonia molecule. So, sorry, for the ammonium, I didn't really <laughs> understand. Uh, I mean, if, if, the, if T commutes with the Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. then the energy splitting between uh, the J plus and J minus mm -hmm. uh, eigenstates is zero. Yeah. And yes. so how can you have uh, an EDM in that case? So you, are, you have, co you have uh, that CP or T commutes, uh, yeah. commutes with the Hamiltonian. Yes. And how comes that the, the EDM is non-zero? Well, it is non-zero. Because you actually, you have <coughs> both this and this. And this is major in the laboratory. Yeah, sure, but uh, yeah. conceptually... But, well but it just means you have these two states, uh -huh, they are the same energy. <coughs> so both are ground state. But this, you cannot draw a picture like this for, say, electron. So the problem is probably mm -hmm. that T, uh, I don't know, C T and CP are interchangeable. No, I think it's because, local, uh, um, it's because there's no requirement mm -hmm. that the electric dipole moment has to be aligned with the spin in this case. Uh -huh. Right, it can, it's just another degree of freedom to, to, to describe the molecule. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yes. Can you say again why the the electric dipole moment has to be aligned with the spin in a fundamental particle? Um, okay, there's a uh, graduate school level is oh, you just apply the um, uh, ecker wigner theorem. Okay, so then the EDM vector now has to be described uh, in the spin degree of freedom. Mm -hmm. Or in the more kind of classical picture, so if you have an EDM, okay, and you also have a spin. If they are not aligned, say like this, okay. Now EDM spin. Now you have some perpendicular components of the EDM. 
Now when the particle spins, the EDM is going to turn around, the, the perpendicular component, then it's going to time average out to be zero. So in the end, the expectation value then will just be lying along the spin, mm -hmm. or anti along with the spin. Yeah, but then but <coughs> you were, uh, you said that the, um, when you turn around the spin, mm -hmm. the uh, electrodipole moment has to turn as yeah. well. Yes. So this is what, the, why they have to move together, this yeah. is what I don't understand. So not, not the, the transversal components, only the, this, that. Uh, because as far as we know, uh, spin is the only de degree of freedom mm -hmm. required to describe neutron. Mm -hmm. Okay, <coughs> there's no additional degree of freedom you need to describe the the wave function of a neutron. <coughs> Anybody else has a better answer? Is it primary theorem? Yeah. Okay, so for electron, um, you under time reversal, this ground state okay, doesn't really map to itself. So it's not a good time reversal eigenstate. So the Hamiltonian doesn't commute. So, so that means this doesn't play with very well with the total Hamiltonian part. The Hamiltonian doesn't like time reversal symmetry if, if you require EDM to exist. Alright, so that's the motivation uh, why we want to measure EDM because we want to test whether time reversal symmetry is good or not <coughs> in the, our physics model. And the first person <coughs> who did this measurement was Norman Ramsey um, together with his student um, Smith and Purcell. No, I guess Purcell was a professor at that time too. Yeah, so mostly Gregory Stillman Smith, you can see his picture here. Um, they set up an experiment in a um, nuclear reactor in uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory down in Tennessee. And you can see that set up. So kind of a linear array here. So they take a uh, neutron beam from the reactor and um, there's a series of spin uh, magnet, analyzing magnet, and magnetic field, electric field, and, and there's a neutron detector there. So um, they, you can see this is a, a local uh, uh, the laboratory newsletter, and it was published in 1950. So they set up experiment, and then they, they performed experiment. Um, but then they didn't really bother. They found nothing. They didn't measure any effect. At that time, they set it up actually also to, to measure the parity violation because EDM, if EDM exists, uh, also tells you that parity is violated. So they didn't find anything. So they, did, they didn't bother to publish it until that Li and Yan actually uh, postulate that the weak interaction might not respect parity and also Madeu Wu and uh, other, other groups found out that indeed parity was not, by, uh, is not conserved in the weak interaction. And they said, oh, maybe worthwhile uh, to look into this. So perhaps, even though this might not be sensitive to parity violation, but this also has a sensitivity to time reversal violation, and then they realize that it also coupled to CP. Even though the weak interaction violate P, but then um, the degree of CP violation is not as strong as the P violation. So this might tell you something interesting about CP, and just T violation alone is interesting enough. So the result of that their measurement at that time uh, get a sensitivity of EDM to the level 10 to the minus 20 ECM. And this is the cartoon of their setup. Is there a pointer? Ah, oh, great. <laughs> okay, so neutron comes in here, and then you have this um, magnetic field here, and then that's used to polarize <laughs> um, uh, iron, fo iron foil. So the spin penetrates through this iron foil uh, foil and then get magnetized, get polarized. And then so you get 100% polarized neutron coming into here, okay? And then you're going to set it up so that the neutron spin, okay, so the orientation of magnetic field is this way, okay, perpendicular to those plates here. And in addition, they also add the electric field, this uh, internal two plates here. So you have both the magnetic field and electric field pointing in the same way. Now the neutrons are just flying through the, ch the, the MP channel in between. But 
you want to make sure that the neutron spin is tilted the right way. So you apply a pyroid tube coil. I'm going to tell you how it works later. So then you tilt the spin of the neutron 90 degree relative to the holding field, and the field and the E field is starting to process. After a little while, in the end of the flight path, you apply another pyroid tube coil, trying to flip the spin to the to the uh, along the original direction. And then in the end, you pass through another spin analyzer, and this is a transmission type of a spin analyzer. You just count how many neutrons are passing through, then we'll be able to tell you this certain polarization state of a neutron. And um, so this is their result here. Okay, so it looks pretty nice. Actually, you have uh, interference fringes here. And then they are also able to just simply by tilting the, uh, they call this um, magnet. Um, the mirror, magnetic mirror here. Tilting the relative angle of the neutron incoming to the magnetic <coughs> angle, you can pick out different uh, velocity component of the neutron. So that at some optimal angle here, so this is a midi radian, uh, you can get pick out the slowest component of the neutron passing through here, and then you get uh, lots of fringes. But now if the mirror is tilted uh, not in the optimal direction, but you pick out faster neutrons, then you also get fringes, but not as many fringes as the, st the, the st lower one. So by that, by doing that, they realized that, oh, actually, by doing this setup, this called separated oscillatory field method, you can actually yield very narrow fringes. Okay? Because their goal is to determine the precession frequency at the resonant to, um, to the magnetic field and the, and the, the electric field here. So they all re they really want to know is the central frequency here. And then the fact that you have many, many fringes here, there's only one resonant point here. So that you have those very sharp separation of the fringes give you enhanced sensitivity to t determine where the resonant frequency is. And also by doing this, uh, they're also not very sensitive to how the RF field is applied. Okay? So even though uh, there could be some uniformity across here and across here, um, it actually doesn't really matter a lot. So I, actually, I suspect, I was thinking that how did Norman Ramsey came up with this idea of separated oscillatory field method? Before then, uh, it was Robbie, right? Robbie actually invented the, the, the uh, magnetic resonant method. So he was just applying um, RF field everywhere uniformly uh, around in, in um, <coughs> the atomic or molecular species. They are trying to measure magnetic moment at that time here. So I was thinking maybe, um, of course, you want to increase the sensitivity of the frequency measurement. You want the atom or molecule or neutron to spend as, as long time as possible inside your apparatus. So if you have say, a meter long of the field region and you want to apply RF field very uniform across this one meter, it's going to be a lot of work trying to you know, wrap around the coils and make sure that every, everywhere is uniform. So, I suspect that maybe Ramsey just trying to find out shortcuts and maybe not applying the RF field uniform everywhere. Okay, so um, see whether he can get away just by applying in some local uh, localized region here. Um, I don't know whether he actually know what he's going to get or not, or just simply come across this by accident. I have no idea. Oh, do you know? <laughs> but then just by doing that, uh, so he didn't have to worry about the uniformity of the apply RF field. And then he gets really, really nice fringe, and then get enhanced sensitivity to determine the resonant frequency. So the technique is nuclear magnetic resonance, okay? And um, so you just want to find out uh, the frequency of the neutron, okay, processing in the given magnetic field here. To d to find out that, you, all you have to do is just integrate this block equation. So it's the change of minute moment uh, due to the torque, and torque is um, minute moment uh, multi uh, cross cross B, and gamma is the gyro magnetic ratio here. Now, if you have spin depolarization, then you have to put in the longitudinal spin and transfer spin depolarization here. Now, in the ideal case, perhaps uh, T1 and T2 are very long here, then you can do those terms, and then say if I just want to look at free precession under a constant field, so now your B will only be happening at the z direction, and x, y will be zero. And then you can integrate this block equation, and then you're, you're supposed to get a lot more precision, right? So I wrote a little um, MATLAB script to illustrate that. 
but I'm sure that everybody here can do that. Uh, but I'm just using this to build up to where where we are going. So Lamar here. Okay, so B zero is in the Z direction here, and the spin originally is at uh, one zero zero direction. So the under the B B zero field, so we just precessing uniformly. Okay, and that's the Lamar precession frequency that uh, Ramsey and Robbie were trying to measure very precisely. Okay, but to to get the neutron to precess in the field, you have to tilt the spin away from the original magnetic field direction. Okay, now how do you perform such a tilt? Anybody know? Well, I know you know, <laughs> but okay, people outside the field. Or a theorist. Is it transverse the magnetic field? Yes, transverse magnetic field. Oscillating or DC? Oscillating. I guess you can do the same thing with DC too. Yeah. Just if you're aggressive enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so with DC field, so now I can do this. <coughs> no, no, sorry, with oscillating field. So originally you have a spin along the Z direction. Now by applying an oscillating field in a horizontal plane here, now you can get a spin to go to zero and then reverse direction and then come back here. Okay, now go up there. Okay, let me run this again. Something I want to tell you about. <coughs> How long does this go? <coughs> Five, okay. All right, so we start from uh, the Z direction, parallel to the B field. Now I want to tilt the field to 90 degree. It's there. Now I turn off the RF, and then that's, that will be the pi over two pulse. But now if I don't turn it off, this will continue going. Now this, the spin will be flipped by 180 degree. Now you turn it off, now that's the pi pulse. Okay, the spin flip. Okay. Now if you don't turn it off, then, then the spin will keep on evolving here. So you have multiple chances. chances to achieve your 90 degree or 180 degree. If you pass 180 degree, it will go back to 270, but it's just the same as 90. Okay, so that's how uh, experimentalists manipulate the spin of neutrons. All right, let's go back. Okay, so, um, so that's the Lama precession, and then we can, by applying magnetic field, measuring the precession frequency, I can measure a minute moment very well. Okay, so in the 50s, people were trying to do that. But Ramsey actually realized that, oh, uh, maybe we should also try to measure electric dipole moment. Uh, it's very simple. Just by applying additional electric field in the same direction of magnetic field, it's going to change the total energy of the neutron, so it's going to change the precession frequency by adding an extra term, d dot e here. And then since it, the EDM is parallel to the direction of the spin here, so it's going to just have an actual scalar factor in the front. Here. So you measure um, the Lama frequency. Okay. So this is something very small we're trying to measure. In fact, people have been trying to measure it for 60 years, and it's still zero. You want to measure this very small amount uh -huh, uh, to reference to something non-zero. But you don't want this to be too large. So you pick a value that's convenient. Okay. So you pay, we pick a uh, magnetic field B0 around 10 milligauss. Okay. Earth field is 0.5 gauss. So you have to suppress the Earth field. Okay. But you have applied this very uniformly. 10 milligauss is ach totally achievable in the lab. Then this corresponds to about 30 hertz of the neutron precession. Okay. Now to extract the, the information of EDM, you apply additional E field. Now you apply the E field parallel, you measure a frequency. In type parallel, you measure another frequency. You measure the difference between these two. You subtract out the 30 hertz component. So whatever residual, they should be proportional to the electric field and the electric dipole moment. Okay. But the problem is that this so far, nobody measured it. Okay. So depending on how well you want to measure it. If the, f the goal, say the, the experiment in US, um, called SNS, uh, Spallation Neutron Source. Um, we're trying to mount the neutron EDM experiment there. Um, the goal is to get to get down to 10 to the minus 28 ECM level. If we want to measure EDM of that level, now means we have to measure that precession frequency of 30 hertz to the accuracy of 12 
men of it. Okay, so it's like a billion, a part per billion measurement. Okay, and that's why idea measurement is so hard. And um, so since it's so hard, so we want to pick the method uh, that has the high, the best, best um, 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 sensitivity to the frequency, sh any kind of frequency shift. So Norman Ramsey actually taught us a lesson uh, with his molecular beam set up applied to neutron. So a particular arrangement that is more advantageous in many cases is one in which the oscillating field is confined to a small region here at the beginning of the space in which the NU level are being studied to another very small region at the end and then in between there's no oscillating field. Okay. And why is this advantage advantageous? Oh, I didn't know I had this. Okay, so, so this is the sequence here. So initially you use your polarized iron foil to magnetize your neutron. Okay, and then this neutron comes into your apparatus um, so in the same B0 field, okay. Now this B0 field, uh, you want to tilt the spin away from the holding field by 90 degree, so you apply a pi over two poles here, achieve that. And then after that, then you just leave the spin alone. It's going to, the neutron is going to spin, is going to be freely precessed in the field region, so we call this free, free precession, okay. There's no RF poles applied in between, Towards the end, now you apply another pi over two poles here. So now this will continue the spin flipping, okay, passing the 90 degree, now all the way down to 180 degree. Okay, in the end, if everything is at a resonance, now you flip your initial spin by 180 degree from spin up to spin down. In the end, you pass through your spin analyzer, which allows only spin up component to go through. So if this process is complete and everything is on resonance, and then in your transmission detector, then you measure zero count. Okay, but that's when you're at a resonance. But how do I know I'm at a resonance? I don't know. So I apply some frequency, goes through this. In the end, the spin is not tilted 100, uh, 100 to 180 degree. There's some small misalignment there. So that I have some small amount of neutron I can allow to pass through. I change a different frequency again, okay, so we're going to de develop a different phase, and it's going to uh, allow a different amount of neutron to be transmitted through. So in the end, I get uh, interference fringes like this. Okay, now I have another um, MATLAB simulation here for the Ramsey sequence here. Okay, so I think in this case, I put RF uh, pulse to be applied about one second, and the free precession time allowed between the two RF pulses is three seconds. And uh, so the neutron originally is aligned in the B0 direction, in the Z direction, and we'll see what happened to the spin. Um, okay, now the RF is on, so the spin gets tilted to 90 degree. Now once you get there, you turn off RF, so just keep on precessing here in the plane. Okay, and the fre precession frequency is going to tell you how big the magnetic field is and also how big the electric field is if there's an EDM coupling. Afterward, now you turn on our field, precess it back to the original direction it's going. Okay, and you take this and then you pass through the speed analyzer and you count how many neutrons are transmitted here. Okay, so the point is that, um, okay, let's go back. This is very important um, feature here. So this is your IF pulse, which is used when, so you have an IF pulse always continually oscillating in the background. But you only get it on when you want to do pi over two spin. Um, rotation. So you turn it on here, you achieve your 90 degree, but then when you turn it off, you don't just turn off the whole IF source. The IF source is still oscillating in time, keeping a clock for your system. Okay. Then by the time that we say, okay, I'm done with free precession, I'm ready to collect neutrons and then see how, many, how, how much phase it accumulates over this free precession time. Now you turn, you gain on the same RF source, now the remaining is going to do the trick of flipping the spin uh, down to 180 degree. 
So it's comparing the neutron precession relative to this very high precision um, uh, time, time in reference allow you to achieve a good frequency measurement. So in principle you obtain one of those uh, figures for each uh, uh, pair of, uh, of, pull, of pulses or not? Uh, so, so this is what you'll get. Okay. So for each frequency, you get one point. And if you want, if you want to map out the whole fringes, this will probably be like hundreds of different points, a different RF frequency. Okay. But in typical experiment, there's no need to do that because as long as we can control magnetic field, it's no magnetic field very precisely. All we need to know is we want to know where this minimum point is that correspond to everything in resonance, right? So we do two-point measurement here, because that at the highest slope here, it's going to tell me where the bottom of the sine wave is. Sorry, this is, I think, cosine. And uh, on the opposite side of the cosine function, then you do another two points. So it's a four-point measurement required to determine the frequency. We don't really do all those hundreds of points. What's the additional structure from that hmm? you get in the fringes? Okay, I'll tell you. Uh -huh. ah. <laughs> so this is, okay, this is not even um, field theory, okay. So Schrodinger equation here, you have two spinners uh, with a spin up and spin down uh, with some initial amplitude here. And then so you have your atomic interaction here, and then you apply external oscillating field uh, causing the, um, at a resonance, so that you will be able to, to jump, um, to make the, the transition between the eigenstates here. And then after you apply your spin flip um, sequence, Ramsey sequence, uh, one RF pulse followed by free, free precession time and then followed by another RF pulse, and then you can your parameter here, so with uh, pi um, RF pulse duration of tau, free precession uh, duration of T here, and then the final probability of spin flipping can be described as such. So the from here is actually this describe the envelope, envelope tell you how much it's due to the effect of RF detuning from resonance. So that, that gives you uh, this broad envelope here. Okay. And then now you can also have uh, um, a spin flip probability can be zero if you have this term equal to zero. And that happened as some specific condition uh, when this equal to this, and you can calculate what they are, and then those additional conditions give you additional zeros, okay, and, and then between maximum and minimum. So then that gives the fringes. And you can tune um, the, the width of those fringes by those parameters, T and tau is the R pulse duration, and then T here. The most important parameter is T, okay? Because you want to measure the free precession frequency very well, if you want to do major something very well, we have to measure it for a very long time. Okay. So by increasing the free precession time here, you allow neutron to accumulate uh, phase for a long time. And then after the reversal, uh, you can get a frequency precession that's inversely proportional to T. That's a free precession time here. So you can see here the distance between the fringes is one over T. Okay. Then the more fringes you can pack into this means this the the steeper the slope is. The steeper the slopes those are, the, 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 the better precision I can determine the lowest point here. That's where the resonant frequency is. Okay. So what is the uh, maximum polarization lifetime? First of all, neutron decays. So neutron decay at 880 seconds, okay? And um, also, depends what kind of experiment you're talking about. If it's a beam experiment, uh, the precession is time limited, right? So you have a neutron travel at some velocity. So a cold neutron is travel at 600 meters per second, for example. Mm -hmm. um, depends on how long you can tolerate to make your uniform field, okay? That determines the flight time. So usually flight time is fraction of a second here. Um, so in order to, that's a very good question, in order to increase uh, the, the T time, um, we advance into another technology called ultra cool neutrons. So with ultra cool neutrons, you don't have, then you can confine your neutrons in your measuring apparatus. You measure them until they die. Okay. So if you have a very good bottle, you can get a lifetime, maybe not all the way to 880 seconds, on order of a few hundred seconds. 
Okay, so pe people nowadays, the state of art of, um, say, um, 10 liter volume, is it 10 liter? Yeah. yeah, it's about 200 seconds. Okay. Okay, so with the Ramsey's um, technique, now um, uh, we measure the electric dipole moment of neutrons, still zero. <laughs> But with the uncertainty of 10 to the minus 26 ECM. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, if you blow up the neutron to the size of the Earth, okay, the size of a positive cloud and a negative charge cloud separation correspond to about half a millimeter of an Earth sized neutron. Okay. For the next generation of experiments, uh, we're going to improve the sensitivity for Earth sized neutron to about um, 10 micron, something like that. Um, and again, uh, there must be motivation to major EDM, right? So we are interested in looking for um, time reversal symmetry breaking and then also looking for a CP violation. We already have a CP violation um, embedded in the standard model through the CKM matrix. The complex phase of the CKM matrix tells you how the quarks should couple to couple to each other uh, via the weak interaction. So, so with the non-zero CP uh, interaction, now you can come up with Feynman diagram that will give you non-zero EDM. But however, it requires a higher loop. So you need to go at least three loops. So you have one loop here, turns neutron into um, a pion, and then sigma, and then here the charge not interact with the electromagnetic field. That's how you couple, you can be sensitive to EDM. And then at the returning vertex here, now you require to get any non-zero CP violation uh, contribution, you need to couple to, to the quarks require uh, the weak interaction here to change this, turn the strange quark from sigma into uh, C or T and then turn back to D and then there's additional hadronic interaction there. So, so that's three loop calculation. You can estimate that the size is 10 to the minus 32 ECM. It's non-zero, but the experimenters have no hope to reach that level of sensitivity. Come on. <laughs> 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 Although it's like one of you here in the audience come up with an ingenious way to do better than Ramsey. Actually, where do you for that, right? It's already half a century. There got to be another, a new method on the horizon, horizon to allow us to push this forward. But even though we cannot reach this, okay, now this becomes interesting. It means means EDM has very small standard model background. Okay, no standard model, not background. So if you have an experiment, you measure something non-zero, and you make sure it's not due to some stupid effect, then that is a direct evidence of the T violation. Okay, and this T violation can, uh, can then be explained by physics other than standard model, which will introduce more particles, more CP violating phases. So just simple things like a one loop diagram will allow you to have an EDM on the order of this um, uh, one over uh, lambda CP violating uh, mass scale square here. So if we measure electric dipole moment of 10 to the minus 26 ECM, non-zero 10 to the minus 26 EDM, ECM, that means we are sensitive to physics that break the CP at the mass scale of one TeV. Okay. Um, so, so far, so kind of history here, um, before the 1980s, uh, so those experiments were done in the beam experiment. The first um, Smith, Purcell, and Norman Ramsey experiments, so they get to about 10 to the minus 20 ECM. They keep on pushing the limit with the beam technique to 10 to the minus 24 ECM. Okay. And then at some point, they realize that, oh, um, using ultra neutron, okay, not only have the advantage of being able to measure them for a longer amount of time, also has other advantages that I'm going to come back to, to talk to you about. And then you keep on pushing the limit. So now we are <coughs> 10 to the minus 20, 26 ECM, still see nothing. Okay. And there were a bunch of other experiments here, um, currently ongoing. Uh, some actually uh, lost them, um, but there are actually more effort um, should be added onto this plot here. So the best hope is that we can bridge another order or two orders of magnitude, get down to here. So with that, uh, standard model uh, limit is still like way down here. So there is 
a region here, if we measure EDM, that will indicate physics beyond this new model. Okay. And at this level, that means the CP violating uh, uh, mass scale is 200 GeV. When you, if we can go get down to 10 to the minus 28 ECM, then you can get the energy scale of CP violation as high as 50 TeV. That's way higher than collider experiments can reach. So what's the reason for the change in the slope of the progress? Asymptotical to zero? Okay, so the start <laughs> points are hope. Okay, those are not realized yet. So, and then they actually get stretched out like this. <laughs> Okay, so um, for the remaining talk, I'm going to talk about the systematic effect. So <coughs> systematic effect, so as you're making progress, okay, you're kind of like uh, opening this um, nested Russian doll, okay. So when you increase the solidity, open your doll, you find out there's another problem there, okay. You work very hard to crack that doll open, there's another thing in there, <laughs> okay. So it's a running race, but it's also fun. Um, so the first thing that um, was realized by um, Ramsey and Purcell was that um, this uh, motional field, okay. So it's a relativistic effect, actually. So this is sensitive to special relativity e effect because our sensitivity is so high, okay. So if you apply a B field here, you also apply an E field, okay, in the same direction, ideally. And what happens is that neutron now is moving uh, in all directions inside in this volume in the field region. For the neutron moving into the page, now you have V cross E, so V cross into the page, V cross E. How can I, for E cross V? <laughs> 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 I don't know. <laughs> I guess I get it in the opposite direction. But anyway, so the point is that the motional field, you can, in the co-moving frame of the neutron, it not only seeing the holding field, it also see a a motional field, okay, as perpendicular to the direction of the B field. And neutron is going to precess uh, according to the total field. Okay, so the total field in this case, now you just add these two together, you get this field, and this is how the spin is going to precess around. Now, when you reverse uh, the E field, okay, because that's required for EDM measurement here. Um, that means now your motion, the same motion, but now your B field is going to, the motional field is going to be in the opposite direction. Okay, so you, but still act up to the original B0. So you get a total B field here under the field reversal, look like this. Okay, so those two vector, even though they are pointing in a different direction, they are the same magnitude, so it's going to give you the same precession frequency. So there's no problem there. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is that, <laughs> Uh, experimentalists cannot align everything 100%. Okay. So, in a realistic situation, you have two fields you try to align very well. Okay. You do the best you could. Okay. But then there's still some angle there. Okay. So, now do the same thing under, you know, for this neutron moving into the page, you have a perpendicular motional field, perpendicular to the E direction here. Now, the total field at to B0 now will be in this direction. Under field reversal, okay, so you can do, say, very good field reversal here just by changing the polarity of the high voltage, hoping that the high voltage electrodes didn't get bumped and then uh, change your alignment. So if you reverse, then you also get a um, motional field in opposite direction. But the problem here, there's a field mis mis misalignment. So this vector now is pointing down, downward, you have a downward component there, so the total magnetic field component now is going to add up to something slightly different. Okay, not only different angle, but also different amp amplitude. So that gives you a different frequency shift. You can calculate how big this frequency shift is, and then it turns out that it's not only uh, have a quadratic turn in the E field, it also linearly depend on E. Okay. And then remember that for EDM, we are trying to compare the frequency of the spin precession with the E field parallel, anti parallel. And so we are looking for some linear E effect. And this linear E effect has nothing to do with EDM. 
Okay, it's just due to misalignment. Now give me some frequency shift that's linear in E. <coughs> and if you are not careful, you can say, oh, I found the EDM. Okay. Um, but turns out that it's just some uh, emotional field effect. But uh, it's still amazing. It's a special relativity effect. You're seeing it with like slow moving particles. It's not even close to the speed of light. So for the molecular beam experiment, it's running out of steam because in order to make this emotional field small, they have to control just to the level of 10 to the minus 24 EC, and they have to control alignment to as good as 10 to the 5, minus 5 radian. This is extremely difficult. So and then when we switch to the neutron storage cell experiment here. Now you find out that this linear dependence here also have an extra velocity dependence. So in the ultra cold neutron, you confine everything in the cell, so the average velocity is zero. So automatically you get something like very, very small here, even if not exactly equal to zero. Okay. So the emotional field is greatly suppressed by using ultra cold neutron in a storage cell. And also um, with that we can relax the requirement of the field alignment to from 10 to minus 5. 0.5 degree, which is very very easy to do, mm -hmm. and also field reversal accuracy to about 10 percent. Can you say again what is the small gamma? If there's a delta omega, is gamma theta b b over c e? Oh, gamma is a relativistic factor, one which is one. 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 Yeah. But so this component cannot you fit it uh, uh, away by cha slightly changing the temperature of the ultra cold uh, neutrons and seeing that. Uh, I mean, you have. I mean, the misalignment will be roughly constant uh, for different uh, temperatures, say in a certain range, and so you get this constant term, uh, yeah, and you subtract it uh, systematically. Sure, if 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 that's a problem, but is this is not a problem. It's not a problem. Yeah. Okay. And you could also use the EDM that you observe <laughs> to uh, reduce that with a little knob that has this control, but I guess uh, 10 to the minus 5 is already... Yeah, but uh, there's a danger of doing that. You might be tuning away real EDM. <laughs> 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 oh, damn it. Is you don't know. Yeah. All right, so, so that led to the ED, uh, from the beam, the molecular beam, uh, neutral beam experiment to the, to the neutron, uh, you see an ultra cold neutron experiment. So this was um, at IL now, um, get improved uh, by PSI, get moved to PSI and then PSI group uh, improve uh, a great deal of this experiment. But it's the same principle here. You have neutron coming down here, now uh, get polarized by again iron foil here, and then you get 100% spin polarized neutron here, and keep on going upward okay, into the storage cell. Then inside the storage cell, okay, you have several layers of mu metal to suppress the earth field. Okay, you want to start from as zero as possible. Once you get to very high uniform uh, and zero field, now you apply B0 to about 10 milligauss. Okay, again, we care a lot about uniformity of this field. And then you apply electric field by putting, applying high voltage on one, uh, on the top electro and then ground electro on the bottom here. So you have E and B field aligned in the same direction. Doesn't have to be super precise aligned, less than 0.5. Um, degree, and then you apply parallel two poles, so just additional coil here that you want around the experiment, then you apply the RF field in the, uh, so the, the B, B direction, B zero direction, so Z, now you apply the RF uh, field in the, in the horizontal plane direction to tilt the spin. Okay. So then you tilt the spin, and the neutron precess, you close the, the trap door here, so neutron precess, but you don't want them to all die away, right? So you, want, so you don't want to wait until the whole lifetime. You wait until maybe like, even after one lifetime, you get about one over E of redu uh, reduction in the population. You have a residual amount of population of neutron, you open a trap door, and you let them drain down, and you use the same polarizer to analyze, analyze the spin, okay? So now the spin will get rejected if everything is in resonance, okay? So they will not pass through the foil, and then you count zero here. Now if there's any kind of uh, RF uh, detuning here, now you will allow some finite amount of neutron to pass through, and that's how you measure the fringes. Okay. And 
you got this beautiful pattern, but they don't spend all the time measuring this, just measuring four points around the central fringe. Okay, so uh, PMPI, um, it also have an experiment here, and um, very similar to that, but with a different um, topology. The uh, most important difference is they use double cell here. So with a double cell, you not only double the signal, you also cancel the common mode um, magnetic field noise. There. So you, okay, in this case, uh, magnetic field is applied in the same direction, but you have ground electrode on two sides and the high voltage is applied on the inside. So the E field in the top cell is in one direction and the bottom cell is in the opposite direction. And you just measure the frequency of neutrons uh, from, from two cells together. It or already allow you to cancel out the magnetic field. Okay, so if we want to measure neutral EDM to 10 to the minus 26 ECM, which is actually the current state of art, that means by applying the electric field 10 kilovolt per centimeter, then this will correspond to 0.1 microhertz of uncertainty. Okay, we want to measure that 30 hertz of precession in the B0 field to this level of precession. Means uh, if there's additional field in addition to the B0 that fluctuate on this level, phantom Tesla, that will also give you this type of uh, uh, frequency shift. Like at, it doesn't add uh, false EDM, but it adds noise in your system, which is very hard to average away. Okay. So what happens here is um, an IL data here. Um, so this is the frequency precession around 30 hertz here. And the real data is blue, so it fluctuates here. Okay. And then you have sudden jump here, and it fluctuates again. Okay. And this jump is a slot just 10 to a minus 10 Tesla. Okay. Say that if you want to get to the sensitivity, the fluctuation cannot be larger than this. And this is huge. So what do we do? And it turns out that uh, this is just due to the ambient field fluctuation. You have people opening the door, okay, you can cause this jump. You have overhead crane passing by, you can have this jump. You have people next door ramp up their magnet, you also see this jump. If you have an elevator going up and down, you also see this jump. Okay, so how do you do, how do you control this? You add in uh, another magnetometer, we call it co-magnetometer, co cohabiting the same area as neutron. And then you use those to monitor because both the co-magnetometer atoms and neutrons are in the same volume, the same environment. So it will, it will respond to the magnetic field the same way as neutrons. Okay, so now you have two measurements. You take the difference between the neutron precession and the co-magnetometer precession. You can subtract out any kind of ambient field. And that's what they did. And then so they turned the blue data point to the red data point. Pretty impressive. And then this is found about uh, Pico Tesla of the field fluctuation. And what kind of a uh, magnetometer you can use? Uh, because the, ma the magnetometer will also subject to the same electric field, right? So it might also contribute to e EDM. You don't want that to confuse you. So you pick some atom that has um, a very small uh, electric dipole moment. So uh, what you do basically is measure is measure the the, magneto the the magnetic field minus the bias. Yeah. Minus the bias quicker than... Uh, oh, I don't think you measure it quicker. <laughs> quicker than what? Uh, so. Not bias, reference. Yeah. Reference. You have a magnetometer reference. But the reference doesn't change if one opens the door. Yeah, it does. It changes yeah. the same way. Both, so both, both neutron and mercury will jump the same way because they see the same energy field. Mm -hmm. and then you take the difference. Okay, so then that's the residual. Other question? Wait, the difference would be, I mean. Yes, the the difference should be EDM. I mean, it's just a bit confusing that the resonant frequency is still at 29 hertz. Mm -hmm. So you're just correcting uh, the background ambient field and not the one that you apply for the neutrons. Uh, yes, that's right, yes. We'll come back to that. Uh, okay. Um, okay, there are other effects. So what's the atom then? The oh, oh, the atom, <laughs> sorry. It's mercury. Mercury 199. It's also a um, candidate for EDM measurement, but um, it's diatomic. 
uh, molecule here. So it means um, you, you could have EDM in the mercury-199 nucleus. All the spins uh, of the electrons uh, in the mercury-199 pair, so there's no contribution from the electron EDM on the electron. Okay. Um, so just all nuclear. But then because you have those electron clouds there, so it will shield the internal electric field. Even though you apply electric field externally, but then the electron cloud will redistribute itself so that inside the nucleus there's no electric field there. It's called uh, shifts, shielding. Okay. So with that, uh, you actually uh, you can guarantee that your electric dipole moment, but the shielding is not 100%. Okay. Um, you can, but, um, but it's much better than just not shielded case. So, uh, so far, um, I think the experiment, I think they probably get to 10 to the minus 30 ECM and still see nothing. So that's a good, very good candidate. I guarantee that is no EDM. Um, and then we just use the same technique of um, uh, polarization and uh, polarization monitoring developed by the mercury, um, um, atomic mercury EDM folks. So this mercury does exactly the same as neutrons? They are in the same volume. This is the idea. How do you measure the magnetic field? Oh, you use the, either it's the um, discharge lamp or you use laser. Uh, I think in the in the eighties they used discharge lamp, mm -hmm. um, but now yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I th I don't think they go down to the tube. I, they must go down. This is just is vapor, right? They go anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, but it will not pass the foil. Okay, and then the detector will not be sensitive to, to any kind of atoms. Are you ready? Have more questions? Okay, there's more coming. <laughs> uh, so in a typical NMR setup, okay, we have a holding field B0, okay, and then we have one RF um, a source to provide your clock reference, driven at a resonant frequency here. But there could be a lot of RF emitting source around. Okay, in your in your environment, say let's just they're allowed, but let's just focus one at a time. Say if you have a second RF four uh, source, okay. Also, the neutrons are also subject to the same to the to, to this additional RF source. So, so then, what will happen to the resonant frequency of the neutron? So then you can do such an analysis. Okay, say if this additional second RF source uh, is well defined. You know its amplitude, it's B2. You know its frequency is omega 2. And this omega 2 doesn't have to be the same as omega 0, okay, or the first resonant frequency. It can be anything. Okay. So then you transfer yourself into the co-rotating frame of the second RF source. Then inside this co-rotating frame, it's going to you are going to experience an effective magnetic field. Okay. This effective magnetic field is due to B0, and this rotating thing gives you a fictitious force that has something to do with uh, omega 2 divided by the gamma of the neutron plus the additional uh, amplitude of this RF force here. Okay. So this is in the parallel to the B0 direction and then this RF source uh, is in the perpendicular direction so you have to add this in quadrature and find the hypotenuse and stuff. That's a d is this a detuning or...? Um Not detuning, just some, something. Say if you have power, you plug into 60 hertz, you have 60 hertz there radiating your experiment. So what would the 60 hertz do to my 30 hertz that I'm trying to measure? Things like that. Okay. Um, all right, so now in this, when things are in resonance, so this omega frequency measured relative to this rotating frame, so you take away this omega 2 here, has to be equal to gamma multiplied by the effective field here. So this is a resonant condition. And then you know what the effective field here, here is, and then you can do such a, do some algebra here. So that's in the rotating frame. Now you transfer back to the left frame. So now you don't need to subtract out the omega 2 again. Okay, so now the omega, the resonant frequency, now becomes your original resonant frequency from the first RF source, but you have an extra term. The extra term is due to this additional, the second RF source here. Okay, and then this proportional to the amplitude squared and then inversely proportional to the detuning of that second RF source to the resonant frequency. But this, this term doesn't cancel between the two. Hmm? This term doesn't cancel again when you flip uh, this, the what? No, no for, uh, forget. Uh, I need to understand. No, uh, so just so okay. <laughs> just focus on this. This this I okay. This is not doing any spin flipping. It's just applied there constantly. 
So it's going to affect uh, the, how, the, the way you measure resonant frequency during free precession time. So it means if you don't find those sources are, try to measure curve highs what they are, you are going to measure your resonant frequency wrong. Okay, which is fine because we are, remember we are measuring the difference of resonant frequency with electric field uh, parallel, anti-parallel. Right, and this has nothing to do with the electric field here, so it's going to just get canceled out anyway. So for, to the first order, I don't care about this, even though it produces a real frequency shift. But it's not an EDM observable. However, <laughs> if you have uh, slightly more, uh, because I told you that that was a highly simplified situation, right? You can have many RF source, you can have uh, all different frequency. So, mm -hmm. so maybe not a real RF source here. Now, some other thing can also create an RF or oscillating or rotating field here. So in this situation, you have your magnetic field here and an E field also in the same direction here. Okay. So the neutrons are trapped inside the cell. Okay. And so, so say if you have the neutron, uh, say you have some neutron trajectory very close to the surface of the cell on the side here. So we'll take one bounce and bounce again, bounce again, bounce again. So most of very likely that they will follow this type of a trajectory, just glancing and angle, bouncing around inside the cell. Okay, this doesn't seem to be random motion, right? So this has a very well defined sense of motion. Okay, so this might be counterclockwise direction here. So if it's a counterclockwise direction, now apply to the E field. Now you have V cross E. So V cross E. Now you have a radially outward motion of field. Now when you reverse the direction of the E field, now it becomes radially inward field. Okay. Um, but again, that's not a problem. <laughs> now this additional problem is here. What if your magnetic field is not uniform everywhere? Okay, you try to make it as uniform as possible, but in, in life, there's just some gradient there. So if you have a gradient in B, now the gradient is going to get compensated by the radial increase in the radial component. Okay, due to the Maxwell's law. So now you can have a situation that you have a gradient along the z direction. That means you have a non-zero radial field in the same direction of the motion of field. So you have to add these two together. So you have a linear combination of a field in the neutron's co-moving frame. It's effectively rotating. So this is your second source of an RF field, which is not applied intentionally. But just due to the nature of we are trapping neutron in the cell, you get this. And because of this, then you get your block she uh, Seeger shift. So when a neutron is rotating clockwise, you get, in addition to the resonance frequency, you get additional frequency shift because you have a linear combination of the radial field and the motional field here, and then inverse proportional to the frequency detuning. And then when you do the counter clockwise motion because it's likely that neutron also have the opposite uh, velocity component. So you also have, for every clockwise, you have a counterclockwise counter motion here. And it will introduce a different frequency shift, look like this. You just reverse sign, sign of the motion, okay? And now you have to do average. So if you have equal probability of clockwise and counterclockwise motion, now the average frequency here doesn't average to zero instead. The average to something like this. Okay, it's nonlinear, and the worst, mo the mo the most worrying part is the emotional part here, because of this reverse sign with the E field, which will mimic any kind of EDM signal you're trying to get. So now, this under the fee E field reversal, the emotional field change sign here. Motion of field change sign here. The other things stay the same. Now you take the difference between these two, and you thought you extract EDM, but there's no EDM here. The only thing you have, so you take the difference between this and this. Uh, you do some a little bit algebra here, and then you get this. So proportional to the radial um, radio field and motional field, and this frequency detuning here. Now you put your motional back field back to its E field dependence. So V cross E here was uh, one over C squared. And then you have all this prefactor here. So the frequency shift will be proportional to the size of the, the gradient along the Z direction. The B field gradient will also be proportional to the electric field. 
and under electric field, you take the frequency difference, and then this this is going to the shift is going to be linear in the electric field, and then you think that's the EDM. That is Can you use the fact that it's a velocity dependent? Like you do different temperatures for your neutrons, and then you would know that you have a linear and a quadratic piece and a cancel. Can you fit for this? I guess you could if we have lots of uh, ultra cold neutron, and then then we can do velocity selection. We could, but so far uh, the most we can afford to do is to load the cell with uh, all the energy we can get. Okay, to get enough statistics. If somehow somebody invent uh, a great UCN source, then we can allow to filter out, do do velocity filtering, and then try to study this effect. True. Okay. So that's um, um, geometric phase effect. Okay. So it turns out that this, after we use ultra neutron, that uh, mitigate the problem of motional field, but now uh, the same motional field effect come back to plague us again in a more subtle way. Okay. Uh, so so far this is um, um, causing uh, EDM shift, a uh, frequency shift, but not on neutron, but on the mercury cominometer. And that's the effect you're talking about. Because the mercury cominometer is at room temperature. It's a room temperature atom. It's moving at a much faster speed than ultra cold neutron. Only five minutes left? Kind of. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I'll go through the systematic effect. Um, okay, so gravitational shift. Um, also, we, so the purpose of introducing cominometer is to subtract out the common magnetic field, right? But then those neutrons and atoms, they are just moving around inside the cell. So they are sampling, they are doing volume average, a sampling of the, of the field. The problem is that the neutrons are moving much slower. So you have actually a striation due to the gravity. More ultra cold neutrons are bouncing around the bottom than on the top. And while mercury atoms, they are just thermal energy, they can go anywhere. So they uniformly sam sample the volume of the cell, while ultra cold neutron only preferentially sample the bottom of the cell. So the volume average of the magnetic field is not quite the same. It differs by the gradient here. If you have a gradient, okay, this is the B field you are trying to sample. You, you really want to find out what this gradient is. But then it's proportional to the gra gravitational displacement between the two species. Again, this is not a systematic effect, just something that's there. You have to, you have to take account to, and you, you compare the magnetic field sample by the uh, mercury and the precession frequency of the neutron that's due to mostly the external magnetic field and the ratio. So this is the, uh, to, to get to magnetic field, you, you measure a frequency, then you have to divide out its uh, gyro magnetic ratio. Okay, so the PSI folks, actually did a very, very nice study here. So they measure this ratio of the magnetic field sample by the neutron and mercury. Okay. And then they can, you can tune, deliberately tune the gradient you apply to the apparatus. And then indeed they measure this ratio actually change, shift with the applied gradient. And you can reverse the magnetic field direction, then reverse the sign of the gradient, and then reverse this curve here. Now the nice part is that by measuring this dependence, then you can find out that the slope here will tell you the gravitational displacement, okay? And also the crossing point here, okay, must be due to, uh, must be at the point where the magnetic field is zero. The, ma sorry, the magnetic field gradient is zero. And you want to do your EDA experiment at the crossing point to control the geometric phase effect. Now start getting uh, confusing. Okay. All right. More effect. <laughs> so R is the the ratio between the two between neutron and mercury. So you have to fix the ratio. Ah, okay. So you have to fix the ratio at that specific mm -hmm. point, uh, which yeah. you get by inverting uh, yeah. mm -hmm. the gradient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So remember this R, the ratio uh, is just the frequency you measured. Uh, by uh, divided by the, the known gyro magnetic ratio. Uh, again, this additional more subtle effect due to the Earth's rotation. So the fact that we are doing the measurement, EDM measurement uh, on the surface of Earth, we are in an accelerating frame. Okay. So the Earth's rotation is going to give you extra torque 
that can also affect how the neutrons spin precess. Okay, so if the magnetic field is applied vertically, then this additional um, rotation of the Earth, which is really small, it's only 11.6 microhertz, but something this small can be added into the neutron precession frequency. So you have omega zero here, okay, and then sine and cosine is relative to uh, your longitude or latitude. Okay, latitude, latitude, yes, the latitude. So you have to decompose that component into the two, and you have to add into um, in the vertical direction uh, the the spin of the neutron. Uh, so it turns out that you have some extra contribution here that's linearly dependent on this. When you reverse the B field, because we do periodically to do systematic uh, check, so you, you reverse this, the sign of this, and then you get a frequency difference of twice of Earth's rotation multiplied by the sign of the, the latitude of where you are, where you are doing the experiment. Now, what does this do? Okay, so what this does is that it's going to affect the ratio you were measuring in the previous case. You're trying to measure the ratio of neutron to mercury precession, okay? And then to measure the magnetic field experienced by neutron and mercury. So you measure precession frequency here, but however, you, and then you have to divide out by the general magnetic ratio, but you have to correct the Earth's rotation in here. If you don't do that, Okay, then you have this extra turn, which is going to affect how you determine R. Okay, the effect is that now, if you don't correct this, it's going to, you're going to get your gravitational displacement wrong. And if you don't correct for that, then you're also going to get a false EDM, as large as 10 to the minus 26 ECM. Oh, more. <laughs> <laughs> We can do the experiment ourselves. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so uh, again, okay, common atomic term is introduced. It was necessary. It solved a lot of problems, but it also introduced a lot of problems, as I show here. So this is one, one extra effect introduced because the common atomic terms, they are all magnetized, right? They are all spin polarized. And they are precessing in the same environment as neutron. And they are precessing at a different frequency. Okay, so for, for mercury, it's processing about 7 hertz, while neutrons are processing at 30 hertz. Okay. So you're going to introduce an additional pseudo magnetic field just due to that, uh, the fact that all those mercuries are aligned. So you have a magnetic field that's also processing. And that's your source of the second iron field. And that's going to cause a spin precession frequency to change. Um, but the good point is that this pseudo field uh, is perpendicular to V0 and it's unchanged with the E field reversal. So, to the first principle, it will not give you systematic effect, but it gives you fluctuation. If you, if you didn't control your pressure, if you didn't control uh, where the, the spin of the mercuries are starting with, then you can introduce additional fluctuation to prevent you from achieving the, desire, the, free, the precision, uh, you, frequency precision we try to do. Okay, so again, this is what I said, 7 hertz in the 10 milligauss environment, uh, you're going to get the block Seeger shift of 0.6 <coughs> microtesla, uh, which is actually not too bad because our goal is 2.5 microtesla per round. Oh, uh, okay, so that's all the time yeah. I have. All right. Okay. Any questions? I can keep on going. This what? What does the super thermal uh, mean? Super thermal is ultra cold neutron. Um, okay. So how are ultra cold neutron? How are neutrons? Are so um, in the reactor, uh, neutrons are produced from fission, right? So they come out about um, MeV scale. And then uh, you get those MeV scale neutrons to come to a thermal equilibrium with the uh, water, got a swimming pool there. So you get 300 Kelvin of uh, neutrons. Um, and then you can say, I want those neutrons. Uh, so room temperature neutrons move at the velocity of uh, 2,000 um, meter per second. Uh, too fast. Okay, we cannot trap them. Ultra cold neutron can, uh, the highest velocity is 5 meter per second. So how do you cool the neutron from 2,000 meter per second down to 5 meter per second? Okay, you can thermalize with a cold, cold moderator. So most of the cold moderator work at 30, 30 Kelvin, say liquid hydrogen, okay, 20 Kelvin. 
So we can get those neutrons to thermalize to 20 Kelvin, but still not slow enough. Okay. So the final step happens as something we call um, super thermal source. Uh, it's a solid chunk of um, deuterium. That's the one I work with. There are also people using superfluid helium, okay, which is a 4K. Okay. So superfluid helium 4K, solid deuterium at 5K. Okay. So you can get neutrons to come to thermal equilibrium with those temperature. This is really the coldest substance we can conveniently use, uh, make a larger amount. They're still not a cold amount. They are still not five, moving at five meter per second. So how do you get to this final five meter per second? You still use solid, but now you want to defeat thermal equilibrium. You don't want the neutrons to come to thermal equilibrium with the solid. Instead, so neutron going, it will interact with the solid. Okay, um, so neutron will lose energy if it can create the quasi particles inside the solid. So in solid deuterium, the quasi particles are phonons, sound waves. Okay. So you can actually find a condition that a neutron can transfer 100% of its energy and momentum to create a phonon, and then you just be left with almost zero energy ultra cold neutron. And those are the neutrons that we're interested in. And we want to collect them before they get re-thermalized again. So we call them super thermal. They exceed beyond the thermal source. <laughs> I know how. Sorry, oh. could, you, could you actually uh, describe uh, in a bit more detail all this slide? Uh, I mean, the entire slide. So uh, you said the, the EDM energy shift uh, is what you want to measure, yes. say, for a single uh, neutron. Yes. Then uh, the relation between the energy shift and the time, uh, how can you be sure that? Uh, oh, this is just rough as back of envelope estimate. We have, we have more precise way to do this, to do the frequency analysis. So it's roughly, it, scale, it should scale this way, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what's your question? Mm -hmm. uh, so so the how precise you can measure EDM is really how precise you can measure frequency, right? How are you sure that the relation between time and energy is, is, uh, is fixed by the uncertainty principle and not by some other uh, effect which uh, is uh, True. much larger? That's right. So we have to, to find those effects, control those effects, and make sure that we can get to quantum limit. I didn't process your last sentence. <laughs> 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 um, so we want to control and want to quantify and control the systematic effect and yeah. remove them. So whatever residual has to be the quantum effect, and quantum effect satisfy the uncertainty principle. Yeah. Okay. So and then uh, mm -hmm. you increase the number of. Uh, of, uh, of, neutron. of neutrons, and then you get uh, so from the previous to the uh, yeah. to the present case, uh, it's a post Poissonian uh, system. I guess mm -hmm. yeah, Poisson statistics. You get from ten to the minus twenty six to ten to the minus twenty eight. Uh, it's not just number. You also need to have high electric field, right? So maybe nominally um, a factor of two or three increase in the storage time. So when you get so the so number statistics, electric field, and the measurement time. So with this new SNS uh, experiment that use, su use super fluid helium, not only as a super thermal source that convert cold neutron into co ultra cold neutron, it also uses su super fluid helium as an electrical insulator to allow us to apply 10 times higher electric field than what we can achieve in a vacuum environment. And it also uses the super fluid helium as a neutron detector. Because now neutron interact with the cold magnetometer. In this case, it will be helium three, not mercury. Mercury will just freeze out, become solid, mm -hmm. um, and then you will have spin dependent inter in, um, uh, interaction between neutron and helium three. Um, it will actually absorb and then create triton proton, and those high energy particles scintillate in superfluid helium, which just happen to be a noble detector, noble liquid detector. So, so that is all. Of those have to work in concert to get to this limit. And it's extremely challenging. So uh, this is the novel theorem of why you mm -hmm. cannot get from 10 to the minus 28 to 10 to the minus 32. <coughs> so you say that you cannot no. reach the standard? Well, well, we already use up all the trick we can in our pocket to get to this. We need so something more. There's just a technology that <laughs> but Yeah, well. But you cannot have your co-magnetometer anymore? Well, we need helium-3. Helium-3. Um, yeah, people know how to polarize helium-3, and helium-3 plays very well in superfluid environment. So that's our common parameter in this case. 
How do you read that out? How do, how do we read it out? Yeah, there's no laser that can be used for that. Uh, so we use, we put enough of them in, inside. Uh, so we use SQUID, Superconducting Quantum Interference Device, to measure the small magnetic field produced by helium-3, not just one helium-3, a lot of them. And then they all process coherently. That's the only hope that you can measure the helium-3 precession. So we measure helium-3 precession, and we measure the difference, the beat frequency between neutron and helium-3 by measuring the scintillation um, um, coming out from the neutron helium-3 reaction. So measuring two will now allow you to extract neutron. So that's additional complication that's um, required to work to get to this level. Other questions? To get to this 3 times 10 to the 10, uh, how many uh, neutrons you have to start with? I mean, there are a few. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so um, <coughs> it's not going to be more than what IL can produce uh, starting from co neutron. Okay. Um, the difference is that in IL, they use turbine source, which is not super thermal. Okay. And then in this, it's a super thermal liquid helium source. And that's also another requirement. You, pu you create the highest density of neutrons in your source, and you lose by trying to extract neutrons out into outside to do your experiment. So we say, okay, we want to get as much as, most as we can. So we eliminate the step of extraction. We perform, we design the experiment inside the source. That's how you get this actual factor of 30, or no, 100. What's the UCN temperature in Kelvin? Uh, 5 milli Kelvin. How long does it take to collect 10 to 10 neutrons? How many days? Okay, we haven't even started the experiment yet. So this is a projection. Uh, we think that we can create about um, 100 to 200 UCM per cc inside superfluorium bath. Okay, we have similar volume as uh, the ILL PSI experiment. So this will probably take about three year minimum probably five year, uh, half a decade to get to that statistics. How will you get to five millikelvin? Hmm? How will you cool to five millikelvin? How, oh yeah, you just that super simple th thing I was talking about. Oh, okay. It's not a, just, don't think about it's come to thermal equilibrium. So it's a single scattering process uh, that totally transfers away the momentum and energy of neutrons. Okay. So in principle, you come out to be zero, but there's some bend, energy bend there. So the energy bend uh, we allow uh, is, is about five milli Kelvin. And that corresponds to neutrons moving about uh, uh, five meter per second. And the amazing part is that those five milli Kelvin uh, neutrons, they come out into your experiment, and then you can trap them with room temperature device. But does it heat it up? No, it doesn't. Not even a bit? Well, eventually it will, <laughs> but, uh, the, but then they probably decay away first before they get heated up. Uh, it's because um, neutron actually interact relatively weakly to the molecules because it doesn't have electrons. Uh, what's the wave uh, packet size of um, the neutron? A few hundred inchron. So people actually use this wave to do um, matter wave quantization in gravitational field. Well, you are an IL, so you probably know about that. Other questions? Doesn't seem to be a case. Thank you for this question. It's a very nice review. Thank you.